146 says, Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people, there's no help for you there. When they breathe their last, and they will. We're all appointed a time to live and appointed a time to die. When they breathe their last, they'll return to the earth. And all their plans usually die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper. Who have. If you have something you are taking possession of, you possess this God of Israel by this relationship that you have with him. You know, I'm praying for Israel. I, I always have my eye, I know you as well, on my eye on the Middle East and Israel right now and, and uh, what's going on over there. We pray for them. Israel is still God's people. I hope they're being obedient. We've learned through Scripture when they're disobedient, what happens? Now, that same is for us. But if we're obedient, we've got this God of Israel as our helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He made heaven and earth. Not no big bang, unless God said, okay, big bang. <laughs> he made heaven and earth. He made the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. 
The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans. He cares for the widows. And he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign. He is reigning. And he'll continue to reign till just next year. Forever. He will be your God. This one who reigns forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, and throughout the generations. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us, your grace, your mercy, your love, all the words that we can come up with and, and those that we can. We throw them all in and we throw them up to you in thanksgiving because we're just trying to lavish the best way we know how of how good you are. We thank you for your goodness to us and pray your blessing now in the message. Holy Spirit, speak through us that they see you, Jesus, and I ask it in your name. Amen. Now, some of you may wonder, wait a minute, this was supposed to be part two of part one last week of Echoes of the Cross, and you're right, it was supposed to be. That's going to come tonight, so you've got to come back tonight to hear part two of Echoes of the Cross, because the Lord switched my message this morning. Well, actually, last night began to work on my heart and my mind, and now I get it, now I know why. He switched them around, and that's good. I'm good with that. You okay with that? It's good that we can listen to God. It's good that we can hear his spirit. It's good to know that there's something else out in the world than just the world and the world's voice. There is a voice that lives within me. It's called the Holy Spirit that speaks to me, that lets me know I love you. And I'm alive. And I have something for you to do today. And today, my job, job, is to preach. Right now, in this moment, this time, in this space, it's what God's called me to do. It's to preach. And I'm thankful that I can do that, but I'm going to be obedient even in my preaching, even in my speaking, even in my walk out there in the world, even when I'm with the family, even when no one's watching. Because I do have a God who loves me. And I respect him and, and I love him. And I'm thankful that he has redeemed me. First Peter. 1, 18 and 19. It says this. I'm going to break it down a little bit. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you. Okay, right now, right here, we know if we think about the word ransom, what does that conjure in your mind? If you're thinking of the word ransom, you're thinking about money probably. There's something that I'm going to have to pay. If someone's been kidnapped, what do they demand? They demand a ransom or they demand something. There's demands that's put on us or on people to get what has been taken or to get what they want. Well, God wanted us, and there's been a ransom, though that had to be paid before we could receive this relationship that was broken all the way back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. So, for you know that God, they paid this ransom. And this ransom wasn't money. It was the blood of his son, the very blood, the very life of Jesus Christ. So you know that God paid this ransom. Why did he pay this? Because he loved you. Why did he pay it? Because he loved you? Because he wanted to save you. He wanted to forgive you of your sins. He wanted to establish this relationship with you for even more than just being saved, just being forgiven. Look at the next part of the scripture says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from your empty life. And guess what? You've had inherited an empty life through your ancestors, whether you like it or not. It might be a good life. I've got a nice car. I've got a nice home. I've got a, I'm thankful for the things I have. But when it comes to my life, that's what happens inside of me. Until I had this relationship with Jesus Christ, I was empty. What can you put in there if Jesus isn't in there? I'll tell you what you put in there. The world and what the world offers. The world offered me all kinds of stuff. See, I can come at you like this because I came from the world. I was rebellious and ran 20 years. The world gave me things. The world was quick to give me things. What I didn't realize was the things, some of them, Linda, that they gave me weren't good for me. And some of those things took me down a road that I shouldn't have never went. And God never intended. They took me down a road as I, search, as I searched for happiness, as I searched for peace, as I searched for life, 
And I realized that life was empty because something was missing. And the something was this God, this ransom that was paid, the salvation. And I inherited it all from my ancestors. Oh my, we only have two sentences and we're not done with these verses. Let's go on to verse, same chapter, same verse. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. Everything the world can offer you, anything the world can offer you, you can say at music, you can say sex, you can say drugs, you can say whatever it is that's out there that makes you happy, it won't last. The highs become low. And then you're constantly chasing that high that you got the first time. And you never can reach it, so you gotta do more, and you gotta do more, and you gotta do more. And then I got to listen to more music. And I got to have 900 CDs in my stack to be happy. Oh, wait, no, it's the movies. Now I've got all these. Now, is there anything wrong with music and movies? Not necessarily. There is, but not necessarily. They could be good. But you see, it's stuff. It's stuff that loses its value. I dare you to tell me what the first CD is that you ever bought 10 years ago, let's just say. Do you still listen to it? Now, if you're a Christian, maybe. <laughs> but not the rock and roll stuff that I was listening to. I couldn't even tell you what it was. It was good for the moment, but it lost its value. Gold and silver loses its value. If you have any investment in gold and silver, you know what I'm talking about. But God didn't use this kind of stuff to ransom you. He didn't use the stuff of the world. He used his son something that no one else could pay and something that no value could take away how do you value someone's life it is either valuable or it is not our Lord's life was valuable. Go on to verse 19. This is the most exciting part of this, ver of this I think, is it was paid with the precious blood of Christ. In case you miss it, in case you missed it in the verse 18, here, let me give you verse 19. The writer's like, I'm gonna tell you what this ransom was. I'm gonna tell you what it was. It wasn't nothing of the world. It wasn't nothing that would lose value. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the way, he was sinless. He was spotless. And he was the Lamb of God. As a Christian, I'm thankful. I've been redeemed. And I've been redeemed by the Lord, not the world. I've been redeemed by God's Son, Jesus Christ. You know, the unredeemed, unfortunately, are just plagued by guilt. Unfortunately, they're, 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 they're not much for them to be happy for. Why? Because they're just haunted by guilt. They're haunted by feelings of, of this guilt or sinfulness concerning their thoughts, concerning some of their deeds, some concerning, concerning some of their words that have come out of their mouths. They cannot truly be happy. They cannot truly be thankful. But as a Christian, I can let that guilt go. I can let it go. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There you are. <laughs> Now the rest of you, let the redeemed of the Lord say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, that was weak. <laughs> Maybe it was because it was two words. <laughs> let the redeemed of the Lord say, amen. amen. That's a little better. <laughs> Christians, we should be thankful that our sins have been washed clean. They've been washed. The spotless one has erased our spots. It's better than any tide stick that's out there. It gets it all out. And the blood covers all of our sins and our guilt can be removed. Praise the Lord. We don't have to let Satan and we don't have to let others destroy our peace of mind by false guilt. Yes, I've sinned. Yes, Christ's blood has covered that sin. I am forgiven and it is held against me no more. Get out of my face. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. I'm not the old guy. I'm not the old fella. I'm not the old man I used to be. Christ has become part of me, and I have become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. A new life 
came to me that moment I accept Christ as my Savior. You know, Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player talking about some sports. But he also became a preacher evangelist, well-known preacher evangelist. But before he was a preacher, an evangelist, he was caught leaving a saloon one day in Chicago with some other baseball players. And they were gathered on the sidewalk and and they noticed a, a group of people from the Pacific Garden Missions playing instruments and singing songs and singing hymns and praising the Lord and giving testimony to what Christ's power had done in their lives. Harry Monroe happened to give a brief message that morning and, or that afternoon and deep, Billy was deeply moved as memories began to race into his mind. If you've instilled the lifestyle of Christ in your children's minds, that's a good thing. We hang on to the promise, right? We hang on to the promise. We put it in here, and and it will always be in here. It will. Now, whether they act on it or not, that's not our responsibility, but our responsibility is to keep them up in prayer, hold them in prayer, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, we pray to God. They will not depart from it, Lord. They're going to hang on to that because I was obedient, and I trust in your scripture. I trust in your word. Well, that happened with Billy. He had been raised that way. He was just rebellious, and he went his own way, and he was deeply moved by these boyhood memories. He thought of his godly mother probably still praying for him and and the church that he had attended, and when uh, eventually tears began to fill his eyes, he said this. He says, boys, I'm through. I'm going to turn my sin, turn from my sin, and I'm going to come to Christ. I guess it's hard for you to understand, but we're coming to a pardon of our ways. That's what it's got to be. We've got to part our ways with the world. Amen. And if our friends don't understand it, don't worry, they'll leave you. You don't have to leave them. Billy goes on, though. He says, some mocked me. That'll happen. Others, though, stood in silence. He went to the mission, and, and, and at the mission, he was called out on God and called for mercy and prayed for forgiveness, and he was gloriously saved. He said this later, I staggered out of my sins into the outreached arms of the Savior. <laughs> I instantly became a new creature in him, and that's how it works. Instantly, we receive this forgiveness and this relationship. So he was thankful that he was redeemed. He was thankful that he was forgiven of our sins. Are you thankful that you redeemed this morning Christians we also can be thankful because we are resting in the Lord go ahead Terry says in Psalm 37 7 rest in the Lord it tells us to be still (laughs) that's difficult for someone with ADHD but that's what we're supposed to be at times be still it's not necessarily in this kind of stuff it's right here be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Don't worry about it. God's got it covered. God will take care of it. Many people just rush and rush and rush and we wear ourselves out. You know, hey, be careful. Christmas is coming, isn't it? Christmas in July, it's right around the corner. We rush and we rush and we rush. Some people try to carry the responsibility of the whole world upon their shoulders. And what does that do? It just ends up frustrating us. It it ends up bringing misery into our lives and not much peace. Well, Christians should be thankful because they know that God cares for them. And we can cast our cares on the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us this. Give all of your worries and cares to God. You have some worries, you got some uh, cares that you're holding on to, let go. Give them to God. Let him help you get through it. Oh, sure, we still have our responsibilities, but it's sure nice to have help. Why do we want to do that? Well, because it says in Scripture, he cares for you. Cast your care on him. He cares for you. Have He just wants the responsibility. Think about this. He wants the responsibility to take care of your life. Wait a minute. That's kind of cool. You mean I don't have to be responsible? Oh, yeah, you got to be responsible. But I'm going to help you throw a hippie ear on me. Well, that's kind of cool. Okay, here you go. (laughs) It just kind of makes me walk a little different. It makes me think a lot different. 
Well, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to handle this thing coming up. I don't know how I'm going to handle this projector. And you know, that's Jeremy. I'm praying yesterday. Lord, I don't know. But if you want us to have PowerPoint, PowerPoint words on there, well, great. If you don't, great. I'm walking in the faith and believing. If we do, we do. If we don't, we don't. God's still going to accomplish it. If there's words on the wall or not. He's going to accomplish what he wants to. He cares for me. But you know what? He cares so much about me. He helped Jeremy figure it out. We got words on the wall. He cares. Cast them on him. Christians should always strive to do their best and then just let the Lord do the rest. I just love walking like that. I've got all these things in my mind and that I've got to accomplish this day. And Lord, I know you, you, you got it. You hear it. You, you see it. You see it all. You know it all. But you know what? I'm just going to trust in you. If I don't get it done, oh, well. If it's a little off center, oh, well. And it's not. It, it, it's whatever it is, Lord. I'm walking this. I know you've got my back covered. Well, wait a minute. you got my side and my front. you got me all covered. I'm going to walk through this life and trust that you care for me because I'm redeemed and I'm resting in you, Lord. An evangelist. Well, look at here, Psalm 23. You know this one. One, two, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, I'll have nothing that I need. If I don't want anything, I don't have anything. I have everything I need. There's nothing I don't. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in these green meadows and he leads me beside peaceful streams. I love that thought. An evangelist was staying with a couple whose young son was both deaf and mute. And the preacher was wanting to do his best to, to share God with us. He's just led by the Holy Spirit to share God with this boy and lead him to Christ. Since the youngster had just started reading, he thought he'd use that to his advantage. And, and he, he wanted to use the 23rd Psalm. And so what he did was he pulled the boy's hand up and he used his five fingers. And he made each finger represent a word. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my shepherd. He would go over those words again and again and pointing at his fingers. And after repeating it for several days, he wrote a little note, a simple note to the boy. He said to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus as your Savior and he'll forgive you of your sins. And he says, I want you to remember this word right here. And he grabbed the boy's uh, pointing finger and he says, it's the word my. The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. And he wanted him to remember that. And he wanted him to remember that so if anything ever happened to him, my would take care of him. No matter what happened to him, my would have his best interest at heart. My would take him to heaven someday. The evangelist meeting ended in town and he had to leave and really didn't know if the boy really understood or not about the invitation that he gave the boy. Years later, however, he was able to return to the village Unfortunately, he found out that the youngster became ill and he died shortly after his last visit, after he had left. But just before he lapsed into unconsciousness, that little boy pointed up his finger. <laughs> and he grabbed it. Once the preacher heard that, he knew the boy had understood. And then the boy raised all five up, giving glory to God given praise to God because the Lord is my shepherd this put a smile on the face of everybody that knew and the preacher rejoiced that boy had testified the only way he knew how Jesus is my savior aren't you glad that you can rest in the Lord Christians also can be thankful because we find refuge. Psalm 191, 2. Psalm 91, 2. We can find our refuge, and it is in the Lord. He, this I declare about the Lord, he alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He's my God, and I trust in him. Isn't that a great scripture? I declare this. God alone is my refuge. He's where I find safety. It's not out there in the world, but I find it in God even amongst the world. He's my God. I trust him wholeheartedly. 
We are aware of our dangers of this world. We're, we're not dumb. We're pretty intelligent people. We're aware that we have an ever-increasing crime rate. We've got wars. We've got rumors of wars. We've got uh, the possibility of, uh, of diseases around the corner, maybe for, for us or for friends that we know. We understand that the crippling accidents can occur. We know that. We get that. But we Christians also are aware that we have a watchful God who keeps watch over us with his protecting power. The marvelous, provincial care of God was deeply impressed on me as a youngster. It was deeply impressed also on hymn writer Ira D. Sankey and traveling one day on a steamer in the Delaware River, he was recognized by some people. And he was a singer, a hymn writer, and he would help Dwight L. Moody in his evangelistic outreach. And the people had recognized his, him by the picture they had seen in the newspaper. And they came to him and said, hey, would you sing us one of your hymns? Would you sing us one of your, your, your you know, compositions? And he said, I, I would rather not, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I would prefer to sing a hymn by William Bradbury called Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. One of those stanzas begins, We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. <laughs> when he finished, a man stepped out of the, of the corner and requires, Hey, were you in the Union Army, Mr. Sankey? Yes, sir. He says, I joined in 1860. He said, Did you ever have guard duty in Maryland about 1862? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I did. He says, well, I was in the Confederate Army, and I saw you one night at Sharpsburg. You were wearing your blue uniform, and I had you in my gun sight, just about to shoot you, because the moon was full that night. And just as I was about to pull that trigger, you began to, you began to sing a song, the same song that you just sang. So Hanky just sat down, he fell down, because he recalled that night. He remembered that night on guard duty in the full moonlight. Sankey, after sitting down, he says, uh, my mother often sang that song to me. And the Confederate soldier says, you know, my mother also sang that song to me. He says, and when I heard you sing it, I realized you were a Christian and I just couldn't shoot you. There's a good reason to be a Christian. <laughs> Gratefully, Sankey stood up and he embraced his former enemy. And he was thankful because his refuge, his protection, was in the Lord. Song says, Precious Jesus, precious Jesus, blessed are we. Thou hast brought us, thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us. When we pray, I'm glad that we have a refuge in Jesus and in God, and our protection is sure. So thankful. So thankful. Psalm 27 1, I think, is what I have. Thank you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? We have nothing to be afraid of. Aren't you glad that we can take refuge in the Lord? Amen. Lastly, Christians, it tells us in Revelations 2, 22, 5, we will reign with the Lord. And there will be no night there. There will be no need for lamps or sun. For the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. We should be, Christians, thankful that because of what God has done in our lives or for us, that not only here and now, we have a, an after. We have a, a, a future. We can rejoice for what God has in store for us. It's not just this. This isn't the end. A preacher once remarked to Fanny, to Fanny Crosby, she, he said, I think it's a pity that the master didn't give you sight when he showered you with so many other gifts. And she replied, don't you know that if I'd been able to make one petition at birth, I would have asked God to make me blind. 
what? It didn't make sense to this writer. And he says, why would you do that? And she says, because when I get to heaven, the first face I'll see will be Jesus. The first face that shall ever gladden my sight shall be my Savior. She was thankful because she knew she was going to be able to reign with the Lord forever and ever. The best is yet to come. Followers of Christ, Christians, the best is yet to come. The Lord is preparing an eternal home for you and for all those who have a relationship with him there we will be reunited with our redeemed loved ones. I get to see my grandparents. I get to see those who have gone on before me. Jesus Christ has promised to come again and to receive us unto him, not to leave us here forever. He's promised he's going to come back. He's chosen himself to do it. He's going to do it, and then we will reign with him forever and ever. John 14, 1 through 3 tells us this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Well, yeah. Do you trust in God this morning? Trust also in his son, Jesus Christ. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come get you. I'll come get you. Why? So you can be where I am. <laughs> and not just be where I am, but be always where I am. Aren't you thankful that we get to reign with God? If you are redeemed by the Lord. If you're resting in the Lord. If your refuge is the Lord, I've got great news for you. You will reign with the Lord. Aren't you thankful this morning, Christian? Lord Jesus, we do thank you. We do praise you. We do give you the glory that you so deserve. Lord, the, someone may be here, though, this morning that doesn't have that kind of thanksgiving. There could be somebody here this morning, Lord, that just is loving the world and just staying with what the world has to do taking what the world has to offer. Lord, I'm glad that what you offer is better. Too many testimonies, too many testimonies that go against the happiness of the world and go for this joy and this peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ, which brings happiness. There is no comparison. Lord, darkness, sin, it covers it covers truth. So I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that your light is stronger than truth. Your scripture is light. Your scripture is truth. I pray that it breaks down any darkness that may be within anyone here this morning, that they too can be thankful, truly thankful for what you have in store for them here and in the world to come. I thank you, myself, and I praise you.